In this screencast, we're going to discuss factors that can affect enzymes and, and enzymes' ability to catalyze chemical reactions. There are a number of factors that affect enzyme function. And as we remember from earlier talk of enzymes, that en enzymes are proteins. And the shape of an enzyme is crucial to its ability to have a viable active site that a substrate can bind to. So a lot of these factors that affect their function will in some part affect the enzyme's ability to bind to the substrate. Enzyme concentration can affect its function. As we increase the enzyme, we will also increase, increase the reaction rate. It's because that more enzymes are, are available to frequently collide with the substrate. We looked at this in lab. As we increase the enzyme with more drops of our solution, the reaction rate increased. Eventually the reaction rate is going to level off here and the substrate actually becomes a limiting factor. So in other words, not all enzyme molecules can find the substrate to actually bind to. The substrate concentration will also affect the function. Again, as we increase the substrate, then we'll also increase the reaction rate as well. Again, with more substrate, you're going to have a greater likelihood for more frequent collisions with the enzyme. And again, the enzyme rate will level off. Um, all the enzymes have an active site engaged, and therefore there's not going to be any, if you will, extra enzymes available. They can't, they can't find a substrate. We call this saturation. The enzyme is saturated, and that happens at the that will cause the maximum rate of reactions between the substrate and the enzyme. The temperature at which the enzymes are functioning also has a, a great effect on its function. Uh, all enzymes have an optimum temperature. This is where you'll have the greatest number of molecular collisions between the substrate and the enzyme itself. For, hu for humans, for example, it's 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. The body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius, and this is where there should be the greatest interaction between enzyme and substrate. Now heat will, to a point, increase the, increase the activity. The molecules will be in motion at a higher rate. But at a certain point, the, if too much heat is added, you actually get a, a denaturing of the enzyme itself. This is where it loses its 3D shape. That's called the tertiary structure of the protein. Think about frying an egg. What you do is you actually use the heat to fry the egg and you're denaturing the proteins in the egg and it changes its physical structure. A cold environment is going to obviously decrease the temperature, but the, here the molecules will move slower and that's just simply going to decrease the likelihood of collisions between the en enzyme and the substrate. So all enzymes, again, have an optimum temperature at which they are going to be the most effective. Enzymes work within narrow temperature ranges. Ectotherms, like snakes, otherwise known as cold-blooded animals, they don't use their metabolism extensively to regulate the body temperature. So their body temperature is significantly influenced by the environmental temperature. Desert reptiles, for instance, can experience body temperature fluctuations of about 40 degrees Celsius. That's about a 100 degree Fahrenheit span. pH is another factor that can affect enzyme efficiency. And again, we want to point out that different enzymes are going to work at a different optimum pH. So much like temperature, changes in pH can disrupt the bonds and disrupt the overall shape of the enzyme. Uh, changing the pH adds or removes hydrogen ions and if you adjust this too much outside the optimal pH then again the actual activity or rate at which the enzymes are functioning can be changed, can be disrupted. The main point here is again that a pH outside the normal functioning range will affect the shape of the enzyme. 
therefore it's going to affect its ability to bind with a substrate. Salinity of the environment, or again how much salt is available, will again affect the reaction rate of enzymes. There is again an optimal salt concentration range at which organisms or cells are going to function at the greatest rate. So salt concentration, if you change it, you're going to add or remove cations and anions. This disrupts bonding again and again disrupts the 3D shape. If you disrupt the shape of the protein, you are going to disrupt the ability of the substrate to bind to the active site of the enzyme. Oftentimes certain compounds which help enzymes are needed for the enzyme to actually be effective. And two of them called activators are cofactors and coenzymes. These are these are compounds that have to bind with the enzymes in order to um, for them to be effective. So they kind they activate it. They they allow the enzyme to be effective. Cofactors are small inorganic compounds and coenzymes are organic molecules. We won't get into much more detail than that, but just know that cofactors and coenzymes have specific roles in catalyzing reactions by the way that they bind with the enzyme. Essentially the opposite of activators are inhibitors, compounds that reduce enzyme activity. Competitive inhibition is caused by what's called an inhibitor. And this simply means that the compound that acts as the inhibitor will compete with the proper substrate for binding in the active site. So when the inhibitor is found in, in the active site of the enzyme, the substrate is unable to bind there. It's like it's already taken up the parking spot in a parking lot. So there's some different examples of this. Um, you can sometimes over or, or overcome the problem by increasing the substrate concentration. Therefore, there'll be a greater chance that it's the substrate that fits in the active site rather than the competitor. Non-competitive inhibition is caused when an inhibitor binds to a site other than the active site. That site is called an allosteric site. So an allosteric inhibitor is going to bind somewhere else on the enzyme, but what that still does is it, it tends to change the shape of the active site. Again, that's not going to allow the substrate to bind where it properly should. It forms what's called a conformational change. It changes the shape of that active site. These inhibitors can cause what's called irreversible inhibition if they permanently bind to the enzyme. In terms that you've already learned, a competitor that is one that permanently binds to the active site and it's allosteric if it permanently binds to an allosteric site other than the active site. So what this does is it permanently changes the shape of the enzyme. Nerve gas is an example. It combines with the amino acid uh, serine which contains a sulfhydride group and the active site of the enzyme is going to be deactivated. A neurotransmitter called acetylcholine or acetylcholine is needed to continue a passage of nerve impulses from one neuron across a synapse to the next neuron. So an impulse can be transmitted normally. Once the impulse has been transmitted, this, there's a specific enzyme that functions to deactivate the acetylcholine. Acetylcholine esterase is the name of the enzyme and it almost immediately breaks down the enzyme. If the enzyme is inhibited, this acetylcholine accumulates and the nerve impulse can't be stopped, so it causes prolonged muscle contraction. And eventually paralysis could occur and even death if, if respiratory muscles are affected by this. So again, allosteric regulation is going to change the shape of the enzyme. So this conformational change, the change in the shape, can be caused in two ways. Inhibitors are going to bind at an allosteric site and it will cause the molecule, cause the enzyme to be inactive. 
it becomes stabilized in an inactive manner. The activator is going to keep the enzyme in the active form by keeping those active sites open. We've mentioned chemical reactions mostly as occurring out of context basically as being a one-step process from reactants to products but the activities of life actually occur in what are called metabolic pathways which are really step-by-step -step small chemical reactions where the product of one small chemical reaction is the reactant in the next step of the pathway so chemical reactions of life are always organized in in more complex pathways this is going to increase the efficiency of these life reactions by offering branching points and also where you'll actually have control or regulation of the entire pathway itself. So because these life processes occur as step by step by step chemical pathways, which are smaller chemical reactions put together, this links the endergonic and exergonic reactions that involve the energy, energy that's needed and then energy that is given off for use by an organism. So another regulatory process for enzyme function is called feedback inhibition. So this regulates and coordinates the production of a certain product that can be used in the next step of a pathway. This is when the final product, the final product of the entire pathway is actually used as an inhibitor of some earlier step. So what it amounts to is that there will be no unnecessarily accumulation of a product or you won't just have an excess of product because the regulatory or the limiting product is going to cause a limitation on repeating the same pathway. So it will generally proceed in a proper rate to keep the cell or keep the organism functioning properly. So here's just, it's a pretty complex example here, but it's just showing that the final end product of a particular pathway, in this example the synthesis of one particular type of amino acid called isoleucine from the amino, amino acid theranine. And the final product, isoleucine, becomes an allosteric inhibitor. It's going to bind somewhere to the enzyme and it will prohibit the pathway from continuing on which will kind of back up the process. In this way, the product accumulates, it collides with the enzyme more often than the actual substrate will. That's going to regulate the rate at which this entire pathway will proceed. So that's a rather quick introduction to what controls or what are going to affect the efficiency of enzymes. So go back, review, stop and pause, compare with your notes and compare with your readings to understand how enzymes can be regulated.